Uh, this session, my name is Rohit and uh, I'm in the School of Human Ecology at Ambedkar. Um, this session is titled Diversity and Digital Divide. Um, one of the things as we talk about technology and the use of technology, of course, is, is, uh, is access, right? And, um, and so some of the presentations here will talk about different learning experiences uh, across different uh, um, educational landscapes across uh, in India. Um, and, and particularly taking up the question of, uh, of access. Um, personally, I feel diversity, we always need to foreground in, uh, in, in terms of our conversation on higher education and all the kinds of things we discussed earlier, multidisciplinarity, pedagogies, and so on. Because, uh, and this is one of my gripe uh, with, with a lot of our, our discussion or debate around these things, is that policies certainly, and even responses to policies, higher educational policies, uh, operate within a very narrow set of assumptions or understandings of what institutions are like, um, their student body and practices of learning. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm, I'm even willing to, uh, to put it out there, a lot of national education policy is simply uh, created out of the experience of Delhi University. Uh, and, and opposition to sometimes those policies is also articulated around the experiences of Delhi University. Uh, for instance, you know, there's conversation right now on, uh, or there was on four-year program, right? Four-year undergraduate program. Uh, I know personally a lot of universities did, did not mind it, but because it didn't work in DU, scrapped it altogether, rather than having a conversation about what it would mean in other places. Uh, similarly, right now, credit-based choice system, choice-based credit system uh, that we at Ambedkar have, we've had it since our inception, uh, and yet a lot of people are apprehensive about it without having even tried it uh, because faculty at DU doesn't really think it's valuable, right? Uh, so it's important to recognize that there are variety of practices, variety of institutions, uh, and uh, as we criticize or as we critique policy for being one-size-fits-all, so is resistance and response to crisis also, similarly uh, working with a homo homogenous set of uh, expectations. Uh, so having said that, I'll just move along. So we have uh, four presenters, uh, Lippi, who's at Ambedkar University of Delhi. She's an uh, undergrad bachelor of English student. Uh, then Mashrood Alam Bhatt. We'll follow the same uh, order. Uh, who's at uh, the School of Development Studies at Ambedkar as well. And we have Molika Bora, who's from the University of Hyderabad and Somya Aroda from Shivnadar University. So we have uh, three, uh, three institutions that are represented here, uh, central estate and a private institution uh, from different parts of the country. Um, and so let's see, uh, so I'm waiting and um, I, I hope to, uh, hope that the conversation would, would, would expand and move beyond uh, uh, what we were discussing earlier. So what we'll do is we'll have instead of sort of having question answer immediately after we'll have presentations 15 minutes uh, and then we'll have a, a, a longer session of back and forth people should feel free to also comment rather than just question right so Lippi, please go ahead Uh, right, but I want to uh, make it full screen. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lippi, and I'm a second year undergraduate student studying English at Ambedkar University, Delhi. Before I begin, I would like to thank uh, my teachers for uh, encouraging me to research about this field and also the review panel for accepting this work. This is the first time that I'm uh, presenting a research paper uh, in the conference, so some feedback is uh, uh, appreciated. Thank you. Uh, the topic of uh, my research uh, is bridging the gaps between <coughs> rural and urban uh, higher education of India through technology. As we all know, India is a developing nation, and hence it is developing in various sectors. Education is definitely not an exception. Uh, 
uh, our country has witnessed uh, substantial growth in the field of education, yet rural education has a lot of scope for improvement. The government is dedicated to developing this sector, but uh, there are many challenges and issues that come along the way. There are differences between the urban and rural uh, students, not in terms of brains, but in terms of lack of easy access of good quality study material, uh, lack of teachers, lack of interest, lack of uh, poverty, uh, uh, gender differentiation, uh, lack of infrastructure, common curricula, and also the surroundings in which they grew up in. There are, th these are just a few uh, issues that I just talked about, but there are more if we, uh, if we look uh, beyond this. Using technology can bring about a huge change in the education provided uh, to the masses. So today I will look at the role of technological advances in this, concept, uh, in this context. E-study materials have already made a huge impact on the development of uh, the education system. And, the, uh, and in the urban uh, area, uh, specifically in the urban areas of the country. Um, uh, uh, these facilities have limited availability in the rural areas. Uh, a technology enabled teaching includes computer and web based materials uh, uh, to make a technology based uh, teaching a reality in rural areas the government needs to establish base, uh, basic information technology that is it infrastructure including number 1 computer and internet facilities computer and internet facilities are the most basic and imp uh, important equipment needed to excel in the uh, in, in in the educational sphere uh, in the rural areas. Also, the shortage of electric power hampers the, uh, the use of IT peripherals, including computers, etc. So we should address these problems as well. Number two, capacity building of teachers in IT. Considering the poor IT infrastructure in the rural areas, most of the teaching staff is neither familiar with the uh, equipment nor do they have sufficient knowledge to teach the students. It results in their inclination to continue traditional methods of learning. Therefore, the training of the uh, trainers uh, on use of IT, both in terms of hard and software, is compulsory to enhance IT use in rural areas. Number three, institutions to train rural youth on relevant knowledge on use of IT. One of the major mistakes is in not allowing uh, students enough time to get familiar with, uh, uh, with the equipment. It is a crucial fault to expect a young student from a rural setting to become friends with a computer easily since the beginning. Moreover, different age groups need lessons tailored according to their requirements. Young children should be made familiar with the technology by showing them the audio and um, with the audio and the uh, uh, video aspects of the computer, explaining them how they can draw and paint virtually telling them how to listen to uh, or create music on the computer. Teens need to learn use, uh, uh, to use a computer on a more technical basis and adults need a more practical introduction to the computer as a handy device for earning a living. Number four is updating them about the recent advances in IT in terms of software as well as hardware. To make the best use of IT in higher education, it is necessary that all the stakeholders are acquainted with latest uh, developments in this field. Therefore, it is necessary to update them on the recent advances. Next, uh, I'll talk about the major information technology options for rural education. Uh, number one is uh, distance learning. Uh, distance learning uh, is done through a combination of different media uh, uh, which which can be written like notes. They can be uh, audio like instructional radio or visual like television. And now as technology has improved, lectures recorded on CDs, VCDs and DVDs uh, and other lessons are sent through, uh, 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 sent through the mail or put up on the internet for online use and can be saved for offline use as well. Through this type of learning, hence, India might be able to overcome some of the ever-increasing pressure that is being built up on the higher education. Today's uh, information technology allows a richly interactive uh, 
uh, distance learning experience, which can, in some cases, surpass the uh, in, in interactivity of a traditional classroom. Now, oh, uh, okay. uh, now let us look at some of the good uh, sources of distance learning and their characteristics. Number one, print. Uh, print is readily available and the materials are inexpensive and it is very easily portable. Number two, audio tape. Uh, uh, audio tape is easily accessible and duplicated, very useful in uh, uh, language learning and it is a linear format with no visual cues. Number three is video tape. Uh, video tape is visual as well as an audio tool which can be duplicated and is easily accessible. Number four is email which is a good a tool to stimulate learning, writing and communication skills. Also it is very quick and convenient. Number, uh, the last one is online chat which is a real, uh, real time interaction and, uh, is, uh, and allows instant feedback. Number two uh, for uh, the major uh, information technology options is e-courses. Uh, we just saw that technology enabled teaching uh, is a great source for good quality learning uh, material to rural students. Free access to uh, text study materials in form of computer-based tutorials, web-based e-courses uh, or guiding materials etc. is another IT option. The access to these materials on web uh, may be very useful in this context. But most of the e-courses are paid which sometimes hinders the access because of poor rural community. If these are freely available, this will make a great difference. One such example is a set of e-courses um, uh, uh, e-courses available as e-krishi shiksha uh, and uh, the, uh, the website uh, link is given in the slide if you want to note down you can have a look after going back home. Um, so yeah, uh, so, um, uh, so uh, one uh, okay. Uh, so the, this uh, is a set of e-courses created in the field of uh, agriculture and aligned sciences. Uh, these courses are uh, the port. Uh, the portal has been developed uh, in a consortia mode with uh, with specialized institutions contributing to specialized e-courses in their area of expertise. The portal has seven options. Number one is online e-learning for UG, which is undergraduates, uh, which is accessible uh, to anyone uh, who is interested in the field of agricultural sciences. Number two is uh, offline e-learning which is uh, undergraduate courseware. Uh, these are the courses for remote area institutions or faculty or students which are made offline on CDs and DVDs. Number three is e-learning for farmers. Uh, here the farmers are given information about agricultural development. They are also provided with the latest information about uh, uh, farming practices so that they can produce at low cost and high yield. Number four is e-course uh, uh, content and data ma uh, management. Uh, this section is very important as the amount of lectures online for each discipline is massive and to have a system keeping the data safe and intact is essential. Number five is automation of uh, 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 contents refinement process. This uh, section is very crucial as well because here periodic, uh, periodical online monitoring takes place where the courses are kept up to date with the latest changes that took place in the respective discipline. Sixth is system administration which is a vit uh, vital uh, uh, system to keep an eye on the whole system uh, uh, and whether it is working efficiently or not and to fix glitches if taking place. The last one is reports. Reports are also released periodically to overview the whole process and mechanism of e-course development uh, and updation. The next, uh, oh, uh, here's a look of uh, how uh, the website looks if you uh, go online, uh, just, just for uh, your help. Uh, next is uh, the uh, materials uh, that are free uh, uh, for anyone who is interested uh, is of the following disciplines. One is BSc Agriculture, next is BSc Horticulture, next is BSc Home Science, next is BFSc Fisheries, BVSc uh, Veterinary and A.H. Uh, which means uh, Animal Husbandry. The next is BTEC uh, which, uh, uh, in a dairy technology, uh, technology. Next is BTEC in agricultural engineering. The features and accessibility. Okay. Uh, uh, 
uh, of this, uh, okay, well, let's, uh, hold on. Uh, the main issues uh, in uh, the technology enabled teaching are uh, keeping the contents of study material specific to the stream of uh, interest of students. Number two is making the uh, material interesting and user friendly for them. Number three is a regular update of the uh, materials to apprise the learners of the latest advances. The media of teaching should be such that the students are genuinely interested and feel involved in the studies. Okay, as conclusion, uh, uh, technology can help to overcome many issues by bringing good quality uh, standardized uh, content to thousands of learners. Uh, these solutions are not as expensive as they appear to be. Uh, prices of computers are falling and with the increase of, uh, uh, and with the increased focus of state governments on wide area networks, reaching the rural uh, populations is becoming more attainable. These options will not only develop the rural higher education, but also create employment opportunities, uh, helping, uh, uh, helping them in uh, getting a job and also in the job itself. The private uh, and public uh, partnership projects may play an important role in creation of IT infrastructure in the rural areas. These alternatives, if implemented, may bridge the gap between the rural and urban higher education. Thank you. Presentations. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I begin, I would like to make two qualifications. Uh, one, uh, this, uh, what I'm going to present here is not much of a paper, but it's uh, more like a pilot study which I was uh, able uh, uh, to conduct in the past week so uh, all the claims and all the conclusions and all the uh, narratives are um, at best tentative so uh, and I'm looking for uh, valuable feedback and comments so that this could be uh, worked further and secondly uh, I would uh, even though I have been clubbed under uh, marginalities diversity and uh, digital divide but I won't be specifically uh, uh, emphasizing on the digital divide though my presentation will uh, talk about uh, the experience of madrasa students learning computers in Urdu. So uh, I would like to apologize to the panel if that is a disappointment. Um, so uh, as uh, uh, the th this particular presentation will be particularly focusing on uh, diversity and marginalities in education and uh, when we uh, consider the term margin uh, it is always defined uh, with respect to the mainstream so through this uh, presentation I would also want to try and problematize uh, what mainstream education today means and uh, argues for and try and disturb this idea of what the mainstream is or what the mainstream should be because the mainstream is always uh, the most dominant idea of mainstream is what is defined by government policy or by the state and uh, what mainstream education is has uh, it has of course made a transition and has kept changing with changing times and the demands of the of the economy and the country so um, and uh, mother sars uh, as i think archit was uh, he made his reference to the mother sars when mother sars were actually the mainstream education uh, once upon a time when uh, especially during the delhi sultanate or the mughal rule where the mother sars graduates would uh, be uh, the most important bureaucrats or the or the law or the, or the courtsmen of the kings and uh, they were trained in jurisprudence uh, so they would be the lawyers they would run the sharia courts and uh, of course with uh, i mean it has a long history and madrasas today uh, they they there's a lot of diversity within the madrasa so they are their curriculum there uh, is really uh, decided on rival traditions within um, you know within the system so uh, to enter this debate on you know um, what the mainstream is 
I would like to uh, enter this debate with the whole idea of the modernization of madrasas. So if you go to the HRD website and see the document on the madrasa modernization scheme, it, uh, it refers to the national policy on education uh, in 1986, which basically talks about uh, this concept of the need of a national system of education and argues for some kind of standardization by saying that all, le all students irrespective of caste, creed, uh, language or sex have to access, need to have access to an education of comparable quality and emphasis on the removal of disparities and uh, equalizing educational opportunities by attending to the specific needs of those who have remained educationally backward. So uh, the whole idea of uh, the, whole, the whole idea of uh, you know including uh, trying to bring those who have been educationally backward, basically those who are outside the mainstream. The whole the, the use of the word backward shows that uh, the a particular value is attached to a particular kind of education. So what is in the mainstream has a positive, intrinsic, and instrumental value. Uh, and while those uh, while those while the body of knowledge and uh, the education which lies outside the mainstream is something which you know needs to be changed or the learners on the main uh, on the uh, margins need to be brought into the mainstream so this is um, the word mainstream uh, again has been used in this context uh, when the document further says that the children of the educationally backward muslim minorities attend maktabs maktabs are basically uh, mosque schools uh, where they learn quran madrasas darul ulooms which are uh, uh, institutions of higher learning within the madrasa system. All the children uh, who study in these institutions have very little participation in the national mainstream. And uh, uh, for those of you whom uh, are familiar with the Sachar com committee and all, they also have said that uh, uh, around three or four percent of the school of the uh, of the population uh, of the Muslim school-going children go to madrasas, and they primarily belong to the socio-economic backward sections. And this is true up to uh, some extent, but not. I mean, not all students studying in madrasas are from like really uh, poor backgrounds, uh, which I was able to find out when I interacted with more students. And uh, so basically, and what the modernization scheme tries to argue for is that uh, to bring these students who have been operating with a particular body of knowledge which they have received in the madrasas, uh, have, been, have been labeled as backward and there has been a need to modernize, uh, give them modern education in social sciences, English computer, you know, uh, science lab kits, uh, math kits, vocational training, and equivalent certification to bring them inside the mainstream higher education. So uh, with this, I would like to try and understand what mainstream education is. And uh, according to this particular document of the, uh, the Madrasa modernization scheme, and Broadly, I mean, this is not like a complete definition of what mainstream education is, and I would encourage you to kind of to challenge this definition of mainstream education. But what I've understood is the state wants to create a mainstream education which includes certain modern subjects, uh, modern referring to uh, the, the, I mean, science, maths, uh, you know, social sciences, uh, the use of computer technology, so information and communication technology, people should know how to use the computers and all, and skill development for employment. So the mainstream education, according to this document, envisages a particular skill set or a particular kind of uh, standardized education or standardized learners who can then, you know, be mainstreamed uh, and, you know, facilitate the... Uh, achieve the goals of the country, of the economy and all. So um, the marginalized section has been defined with the mainstream and there's a kind of a negative connotation here uh, to, the, to the knowledge systems which the ma marginalized, the so-called marginalized are being trained in. Uh, in this case, uh, what students learn in madrasas are the, the Islamic theology and other, other things. And modernization essentially, what I understand from it is the bridge between the marginalized island, which are the madrasas here, and the mainstream mainland, which is the mainstream education, and the learners are gently pushed or pulled towards the latter from the former. Uh, what I essentially want to find out, uh, the, the answers which I'm seeking, is to this question, that is the mainstream marginal dichotomy, which clearly has been created by the mainstream, I mean, I belong to that mainstream, uh, 
is it relevant for the learners who have experienced both sides of the bridge? And by learners, I refer to Madarsa graduates uh, who uh, have been labeled as those from the margins, who have entered mainstream higher education uh, as defined by the state or the mainstream. And is this question of you know, that this dichotomy being there of the mainstream uh, marginal, is this, does this explain the reasons behind this transition of the students from the margins to the mainstream? So uh, through my uh, presentation, I'll try and find answers to this question as to whether this ma marginal mainstream divide, which has been created by the, by the mainstream, is it really relevant for the learners who have made this transition? Uh, so uh, because of very restricted time resources, I had to restrict my study to uh, students or uh, some students which uh, are studying in uh, a mainstream university in Delhi, that, the JNU, uh, and who have graduated from this one particular madarsa in Delhi, uh, which is called Jamia Islamia Sanabil. And uh, I, I tried to put this question in front of them and see how their narratives tried to answer this question and how they understood this whole mainstream marginal dichotomy. So uh, very quickly, uh, so that I can just qualify who my respondents were. Uh, they were, all of them were male, and all of them uh, have graduated from this madarsa and are pursuing their Arabic, their BA, MA, MPhil, and PhD in Arabic from JNU. And uh, I, uh, the one limitation is I, I didn't get time to investigate in you know, what kind of socioeconomic background they were from, uh, which I think is a limitation of the study. But anyways, the, the, if you go to the website of this, um, Mother Said says the focus of the curriculum is on the teaching of the Quran, the Sunnah, Islamic monotheism, Islamic law, memorization of Quran and Arabic language. And alongside Islamic and Arabic ed education, courses on Hindi, uh, English, science, maths, economics are also part of the curriculum. Uh, and it, it is through the introduction of a curriculum that takes care of both religious and modern education and meet the challenges of modern times. We lay emphasis on inculcating true uh, Islamic models. Um, this madarsa is not recognized by uh, the government, th their education, but they have some kind of affiliations with uh, and memorandum of, un of understandings with universities like JNU for certain courses. So they say we, we, uh, their degree is recognized by the Arabic department of JNU by many departments of Jamia Malia Islamia. Students from here go uh, to do Yunani medicine in Jamia Hamdard. They go to um, Aligarh Muslim University. And um, many also go f go ahead and uh, you know they be become preachers or they teach Quran or they um, I mean basically dini uh, kam jo in the words of the mother sir. So um, um, when they were asked to reflect, uh, when five minutes left. Okay, when they were asked to. Uh, you know, reflect on their motivation and choices for higher education. So some of the uh, some of the students, and if you can read with me, um, one student said that the certification of a mainstream university education was extremely important for him. And he said that I developed an interest in writing articles, speeches in Urdu on social themes through the lens of Islamic philosophy. And my writings focused on offering solutions of social ills. In Sanabil, we were supposed to write essays in Urdu and Arabic regularly. I wrote an article on the importance of education when I was in middle school, which was published by a local magazine and then I started co contributing articles to the magazine on a monthly basis and also contributed uh, to Urdu newspapers. I was the editor of the magazine and I thought that the prefix of doctor in my name was necessary for the Islamic scholars to engage with my writing seriously. So even though he was operating with a particular body of knowledge which is which is the specialization of a madarsa, he thought that the validation of a mainstream university was important so that people from his own madarsa community could engage with it seriously. Uh, he also said that I didn't have many options uh, before joining Arabic. I mean, because a lot of his seniors joined Arabic. Uh, so, and he didn't have, you know, a uh, lot of choices as well because his degree wasn't recognized. His mother's degree wasn't recognized by a lot of universities. But there was a pull from the seniors in which, uh, of his seniors who were studying in uh, these universities. So one of them, Arif, who's a BA student in JNU, he said, I saw seniors going to Jamia and JNU and when I interacted with them, I was inspired by them to study further. I also wanted to pursue my BA in Arabic. While I want to continue till MA and will apply for my national eligibility test, 
uh, I'm not sure if I want to be in academics. There are job opportunities which require knowledge of Arabic, which I'm interested in. Uh, another BA student, he said, I'm from Nepal and I'm the youngest in my family. My brother is in the Middle East pursuing higher education and Islamic studies. He encouraged me to study Arabic further because I was interested in studying further. There was no, and there was no socioeconomic compulsion. I chose to do my BA, and um, even though he had some other options. Uh, and the, th the third uh, reason of, a uh, third motivation of students uh, from madrasas joining higher education, uh, mainstream higher education uh, university like JNU, is the instrumental role of which higher education has in employment. So uh, Ali, another PhD student, he said that opportunities in acad academia for us is limited. Many students pursuing Arabic work part-time or full-time in BPO centers in Delhi NCR and handle operations of corporates in Arab countries. Arabic is the official language of 22 countries. Also, students apply for vacancies in various embassies, jahan pe, uh, where you're required uh, knowledge for Arabic is a prerequisite. And we have an edge in these jobs uh, because we have a grip over Arabic because of our madrasa background. And also, we can speak English because of our JNU campus background, which improves our articulation. So he is, for, for, for these learners, the, the course of education which they are taking from the mothers are to JNU is a very mainstream idea for them itself. I mean, even though they might say that mothers are on the margins, it's a very mainstream thing for them what they are doing. Though they, they keep um, engaging with the mainstream every time their degree is not recognized. They, 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 it's like an invisible wall of mainstream which, you know, which they like hit. Uh, whenever they realize, oh, our degree is not recognized. But um, anyways, um, Computer education specifically for the requirement of this panel, uh, a lot of students because uh, uh, their uh, English is not very strong from the mothers of background who, with whom I interacted, they learned uh, computers in Urdu and many of them were taking a government certified course on uh, desktop printing and MS Office. It, because it was government certified, students felt that you know it, uh, they should do it and it, uh, it is. Uh, but the but the motivation to join this computer course was not because it's something which is considered mainstream by the state, but people had, some people thought that yes, I can get job opportunities because of this, but for some people it was something which would complement their own traditional body of knowledge and engaging with that knowledge. So for example, Ali, uh, who was, who, he was doing his PhD, no, I think he was doing his BA. He said, I joined the DTP course in a computer center near my madrasa because I wanted to learn how to design the cover page of my madrasa magazine. I'm not very keen on using this knowledge for professional purpose. And now, oh, sorry, he was a PhD candidate. My PhD thesis is on digitally produced Arabic literature. A large body of knowledge on Islam and other subjects are available in Arabic on the internet. Madrasa graduates should be able to have access to them. Iqbal doing his MPhil, he said he, he was from uh, Deoband, which is like the biggest uh, madrasa in India, uh, Darul Uloom. And he said, I did not know how to use a computer because I didn't, they didn't have it in their madrasa. But now because I'm doing, because he's doing his MPhil thesis, now he needs to know how to use the computer and all, uh, which, uh, and all, all these uh, scripts, all, all the softwares which are they, they're using in page and all are in Urdu. Uh, uh, I think I'll need three more minutes, I'm really sorry. Uh, so through these conversations, there was this new idea of modern education, which these uh, mothers or students were speaking. And I was like, really, I had a very stereotypical image of the mothers uh, education, but these students really had their own opinion of what modern is. So uh, for example, Amir, who's doing his PhD again in JNU, he said that the mothers in which he studied, it trains us in a way that whatever we choose to do after graduation, we uphold the principles of Islam in our life through our work, whatever we choose to do. It's, but however, on the idea of modernization of mother's hours, he said it's not practical to teach all subjects like math, science, English at the same level as that of other schools, along with Islamic education. Because deep knowledge in Islam is the primary objective of madrasa education, it needs to create experts in Sharia and other Islamic sciences who can understand, engage with social issues and write on it. Currently, madrasas do not produce intellectuals who can articulate and write well. And then he went on to say Islamic studies in Indian universities is not very advanced. We learn more in our madrasa than what we learn in um, some uh, in like first age Arabic in JU. And we need much more resources to reach the level of research conducted in Medina University. Now for this learner, mainstream education is what is given in Medina University. He's not comparing himself with what is given in, you know, like uh, in JNU or something, some other mainstream university. 
and he's his idea his objective from um, from higher education is after my phd i plan to initiate a research center which will work on creating updated syllabi for madrasas the syllabus is outdated he says some madrasas are still teaching students texts from the 8th century and focus on rote learning than critical engagement i'm also planning to work on creating short term courses on writing and research skills for madrasa students who can scientifically and scientifically here means through the lens of islamic sciences and intellectually engage with issues through the lens of islam so he's he's trying to borrow a lot of things from mainstream higher education in terms of you know research methods and writing skills and he he says that the what mainstream education uh, is characterized by through uh, you know internet and the data which is online knowledge which is online he wants to borrow those characteristics of higher education and give it to the traditional body of knowledge which he has operated with in his madrasa uh just one more two more slides the <laughs> uh i'm sorry i have a habit of this uh, uh, uh one more learner which i wanted to quote was um, arif he says that if someone becomes an expert in islamic knowledge but cannot fill a university form because he doesn't know hindi or english well that's a problem these subjects are also important to function in a day to day life to engage with others and expand our knowledge which we have received in the madrasa so he also sees the instrumental role of modern subjects uh, called modern by the government and by uh, the mainstream but he then wants to use these modern subjects to really engage with his traditional uh, his body of knowledge which he holds with a lot of reverence which is islamic uh, sharia islamic law islamic jurisprudence and uh, okay so i would like to make some tentative conclusion and claim, conclusions and claims and i can't believe i have the audacity to make these conclusions uh, after like two days of field work but um, what i understand from these narratives is that the mainstream marginal dichotomy as un as uh, understood by me which is the mainstream doesn't explain these aspirations and choices of students in transition from the madrasa to the university the reasons are more complex so essentially the uh, my understanding that students at the margins want to come to the mainstream because mainstream embodies or says that th these are certain skills which are these are the bodies of knowledge which are better or uh, you know you should come and acquire them is something which these learners don't really uh, are not motivated by but they are motivated by a lot of other things in the mainstream uh, you know uh, universities which they would want to borrow and take back to the madrasa second uh, i second conclusion is that the debate on modernization of madrasa education should appreciate the importance of modern technology and research methods as one of the phd students said and in engaging with the body of knowledge which madrasas specialize in operating with so um, because there's a lot of suspicion uh, with which the whole modernization process is uh, looked at by the madrasa committee they think it will dilute the religious character but then modern certain modern subjects do facilitate their own engagement with the knowledge which they have and finally there is a positive role of madrasa graduates in higher education and this is where the role of higher education is in equalizing as this conference attempts to i mean wants to talk about uh, is to build that bridge between the island of the margin and the mainland uh which is the mainstream by designing bridge courses um you know career counseling as one of the students but said he, i mean the whole idea of networking so all these all the students and all the higher education uh, you know intellect which can have a role to you know kind of instead of you know coercively pulling people from the margins to the mainstream but maybe try create a bridge which in which both sides talk to each other and learn from each other okay with that i would like to conclude thank you we need to uh, move along now <laughs> but uh, i just i just was reminded of something uh, in terms of uh, this learning of arabic i don't know if you encountered anyone or not but there's a lot of push uh, in the us for instance towards uh, arabic learning and so a lot of american uh, students would would come down to madrasas and spend time there learning arabic so that further sort of particularly you know because there's now jobs in the strategic whatever sector industry in the us uh, for uh, people who can speak and write arabic i wasn't aware of that that's interesting all right molika please go ahead um, good afternoon everyone so i'm molika third year undergrad student from university of hyderabad so my paper is really simple uh, it's about my experience from my internship 
so I'm presenting a paper for the first time here. And please do forgive me for my mistakes and bear me for 15 minutes. So as we know that the main highlight of this conference is learning from learners. So I would like to put up a simple question that uh, what is learning? So can we do just a little bit of brainstorming? Like what is learning? Anyone wants to? I, I read that on Wikipedia. I, mean, I knew this question might come sometime. So I did check Wikipedia on this. I'm really sorry. I, I mean, it's really childish. But I think learning is more like a, a, I mean, like an informal continuous process while education is more like an, a, a formal process received while I'm, I, I think I should stop here. <laughs> yeah, uh, learning is a continuous process. Um, it is modification behavior through experiences and uh, it begins in, human, in the human being from infancy and yeah, of course, after that it just carries on. Yeah. So I'd like to give the psychological APA definition of learning, which is a relatively permanent change in behavior brought about by experiences and mental processes. Just putting it out there. Thank you. So learners, we all know, we are all learners here. Yes, so. So uh, nowadays, we see a professor standing in front of us uh, in the classroom lecturing, students sitting in a desk in rows, taking notes on paper. Some interaction between the students and the professor, probably not much between the students. Uh, we would see books, pencils, a chalkboard, and eraser. Colleges and universities are about people and knowledge. They are about learners. Learners bring unique learning styles, attitudes, and need to the uh, learning environment. They are individuals. Many, of nev many have never known life without the internet. They are the net generations. Others are non-traditional students who brings more experiences and more personal and family obligations to the learning environment. So with this, I would like to talk about my internship. Uh, so my internship was in Hyderabad, Karimnagar district, uh, that, uh, a resident, in a residential school, Telangana Social Welfare Residential School. So where I need to teach some group of students who belongs to different age group, different villages, and even with different understanding levels. I was part of a 10-day camp for adolescents, girls, and boys that aim to equip them with critical knowledge and life skills that would enable them to take charge of their lives. And our also motive was that the camp should not feel like school. We were responsible for facilitating learning activities through quiz and action games, stories, group work, and much more. We also learned from the campers by encouraging them to speak about their own lives and sharing their opinions. So I was allotted 32 students. So the first day of my camp was like two worse, not worse, because the campers will sit in front of you and they will just keep on staring on your face, what you wear and how you are speaking. They will not speak a word because they're like, who is this girl sitting in front of us and what she is speaking and all that. So our internship goal was to help marginalized adolescent girls and boys in India uh, to take charge of their future by giving them critical knowledge and life skill through activity-based camps. Critical knowledge means information about basic health uh, safety, self-awareness, rights, higher education, marriage, and future plannings. Uh, life skills are interpersonal skills, leadership, and problem-solving, inde uh, independent and critical thinking ability. The campers were basically aged between 11 to 16. Because this is a turning point where decisions are being made for them. And without information, they have little control over their own future. Because they cannot speak for themselves, they may remain caught in a continuous cycle of poverty and social inequality. So after 10, ten days of my internship, at, at least 1% uh, change was seen in those 32 students' behavior, in understanding things, 
and they also learn to react to any of the situation which you put in front of them. They learn from each other many things. They learned about complete different subject, and this was possible by teamwork. They came up with innovative ideas when they were given group activities. It was also seen that group activities play an important role in learning from others. Not only students should be given, an, given the opportunity for self-assessment and be encouraged to evaluate their habits, attitudes, and behavior with respect to personal health and well-being. This can be accomplished through real-life activities and stimulations in which students became, become involved in a meaningful way. Uh, individual students may be better suited in learning in a particular way using distinctive modes of thinking, relating, and creating. The notion of students have, having particular learning styles has implications for teaching strategies because preferred modes of input and output vary from one individual to another. It is critical that teachers use a range of teaching strategies to effectively meet the needs of individual learners. So with this, I would like to suggest that if government introduce such winter or summer internship or courses which one is able to sh where one is able to share their knowledge and even learn from others, it will be beneficial for us and even to whom we are teaching and giving knowledge because it will, be, it will enhance their knowledge and will be able to learn from our future generation who can shape country in a new form and together can help India made, made, make better and a developed country. Thank you. A very good afternoon, everyone. I am Soumya Arora from Shiv Nadar University, and the title of my paper is Scope of Online Pedagogies and Blended Learning. The new environment of an interactive online learner-centered approach has completely metamorphed the process of education. This education process believes in the ideology of the delivery and dissemination. Departments of progressing and continuing education in universities were quickly to respond to instructional opportunities offered by the internet. The distance education mission of continuing education has been greatly enhanced by creative uses of the internet. Regardless of the provider and the structure of the course design, the early focus on online instruction emphasized asynchronous instruction to maximize flexibility for students and to take full advantage of the features offered by the internet. Today, Hybrid courses that combine face-to-face -face instruction with web-based features are common on most campuses. Technology makes online instruction possible. However, it is the design and pedagogy of online instruction combined with content and that represents the significance of this new form of teaching and learning. I have researched a lot on the Sloan Consortium that was conducted in 2000, 2003 and which was, and it was presented by Bill Pels, who was a professor of psychology. And I've been researching on his principles, and these are, his, these are the following principles that he puts across. His first principle is to let the student do most of the work. He asserts, the more quality time students spend engaged in content, the more of that content they learn. The specific examples of activities for which the students do the work while the professor provides supports are A, student-led discussions, B, student find, students findings and discussions of the web resources. C, students helping each other, which is also known as peer assistance. D, students grade their own homework assignments. E, case study analysis. Pelz's second principle states that interactivity is the heart and soul of, effect, of, of, of effective asynchronous learning, but interaction must stretch beyond simple student discussions. Students can be required to interact with another, with the professor, with the text, with the internet, with the entire class, in small groups or teams, one-on-one -on -one with the partner, etc. 
In addition to discussing the course contents, students can interact regarding assignments, problems to solve, case studies, lab activities, etc. Any course can be designed with required interactivity. The third principle is to strive for presence. There are three forms of presence for which to strive in online learning. Social, pre social presence, with when participants in an online course help establish a community by learning, of learning by projecting their personal characteristics into the discussion. They present themselves as real people. There are at least three forms of social presence, which is effective, which is the expression of emotion, feeling, and mood. Interactive, which is the evidence of reading, attending, understanding, and thinking about others' responses. Cohesive, which is responses that build and, build and sustain a sense of belongingness, group commitment, or common goals and objectives. Cognitive presence, which is the extent to which the professor and the student are able to construct and confirm meaning through sustained discourse in a community of inquiry. Cognitive presence can be demonstrated by introducing factual, conceptual, and theoretical knowledge into the discussion. The value of such a response will depend upon the source, clarity, accuracy, and comprehensiveness of the knowledge. Teaching presence, which is the facilitation and direction of cognitive and social process for the realization of personally meaningful uh, and educationally worthwhile learning at outcomes. There are two ways that the professor and students can add teaching presence to a discussion. Facilitating a discussion by identifying areas of agreement and disagreement, seeking to reach consensus, encouraging, acknowledging, and reinforcing student contributions, and direct instruction by presenting content in question, focusing the discussion, summarizing the discussion, injecting knowledge from diverse sources, responding to technical concerns. The online teaching and learning benchmarks could be the student interaction with faculty and other students is an essential characteristic and is facilitated through, facilitated through a variety of ways, including voicemail or, and or email. Feedback to student assignments and questions is constructive and provided in a timely manner. Students are instructed in proper methods to effective research, including assessments of the, of the val val validity of resources. Instruction materials are reviewed periodically to ensure they meet program standards. The convergence of online and face-to-face -face education. In general terms, blended learning combines online delivery of educational content with the best features of classroom interaction and live inter instruction to personalize learning, allow thoughtful reflection and differentiate instruction from student to student across a diverse group of learners. Blending learning should be viewed as a pedagogical approach that combines effectiveness and socialism, socialization opportunities of the classroom with the technologically enhanced active learning possibilities of the online environment rather than a ratio of delivery mod modalities. Blending learning represents a shift in instruction strategy, just as online learning represents a fundamental shift in the delivery and instructional model of distance learning. Blending learning offers the possibility to significantly change how teachers and administrators view online learning in the face-to-face -face setting. The blended structures and unstructured learning, not all forms of learning are very structured, or premeditated, or formal learning program with organized content and specific sequence like chapters in a textbook. In fact, most learning in the workplaces occurs in an unstructured form, such as meetings, hallway conversations, and email. A blended program design may look to capture active conversations and documents from unstructured learning events into knowledge repositories available on demand, supporting the way knowledge workers collaborate and work. The best practice practices in teaching and action could be online discussion forums and student collaboration on assignments. Online discussion forums are one of the best ways to facilitate interaction and learning in the online classroom, in part due to their ability to promote constructivist thinking, critical thinking, and high-order thinking, and all while distributing knowledge among all students in the class. Additionally, discussion is a relatively simple way to encourage interaction in the online environment. However, regardless of the technologies used, online discussion forums lose effectiveness without the development of thoughtful and relevant questions and instructions mod instructors' moderation of responses. The guidelines that effectively promote that important element, constructivist thinking in the online discussion and pedagogy, could be one, pose a stimulating question, two, brainstorm answers to the question, three, compare ideas, four, fuse to the curriculum, 
The second way is to facilitate interactivity, which encourages student collaboration, relies on the issues of educational technologies to simulate face-to-face -face meetings when students work together on assignments. Other practices can be by preparing students for online learning, specifying course goals, expectations, and policies, creating a warm and inviting atmosphere to build a learning community, promote active learning, model effective online interaction, monitor students' progress and encourage lagging students, assess students' messaging in online discussions, sustain students' motivation and provide feedback and support, deal with conflicts properly, encourage students to regulate their own learning, understand the impact of multiculturalism. To conclude, the advancement of online medium for learning is progressing at a fast rate that was avant grante a few years ago is just a thing of the past. In, the, in this paper, it is clearly established that there is growing evidence from research in e-learning that certain strategies, techniques, and methods, when implemented, will enhance teaching and learning just as certain tactics and strategies do work in face-to-face -face pedagogy. The distance education mission of continuing education has been greatly enhanced by creative uses of the World Wide Web. The use of technology has become systematic to instruction in higher education, regardless of the provider and the structure of the course design. The early focus on online instruction emphasizes asynchronous instruction to maximize flexibility for students and to take full advantage of the features offered by the internet. As online courses become more popular on traditional campuses, synchronous courses gained in popularity. Today, hybrid courses that combine face-to-face -face interaction instruction with web-based features are common on most campuses that are also famously known as blended learning. Technology makes instruction possible. However, it is the design and pedagogy of online instruction combined with the content that represents the significance of this new form of teaching and learning. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so there are several things actually on the table that people can respond to. There was my opening sort of salvo about FYUP and all the rest of that. Uh, then uh, mainstream, sort of understanding, reconceptualizing mainstream or, or the margins in education, um, especially in the case of madarsas, as Mashud uh, discussed. The number of questions around e-learning uh, that the other two uh, speakers talked about. What about e-learning or such uh, methodologies? Actually, one of the things that struck me from previous uh, um, session, Srijan's uh, wonderful presentation, I was just trying to translate that to uh, to a place that, uh, for in, in my own field work in, in Himachal, in a village, uh, as to what internet means to them uh, and their relationship of alienation or, and, and so on with the internet. Because I know for a fact WhatsApp is pretty popular now and people uh, seem to love it for various reasons, including uh, that someone who sells hardware in a shop there doesn't have to travel all the way to Chandigarh now. Right, to see what they are going to sell, and they simply are sent pictures on WhatsApp. Um, so what does it mean? So some of the point is some of the uh, earlier ideas about lack of access. Uh, I'm just wondering how much do they, uh, do they fit now, because people do have access. So the, there are second generation perhaps questions now that we perhaps would like to discuss. So there's plenty of things. Uh, the floor is open. Uh, don't just, I mean, feel free to also comment rather than just, just question the yeah. Uh, hi, my question is for Soumya. Uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, these online classes and how they are uh, engaging and how online forums especially are one of the best ways to engage students. But uh, by virtue of having a brother who is very lazy and makes me write his essays, I have ta I've taken the class in an American college, like an essay writing class, that was some sort of course like this, that was summer course, right? I didn't accept and all. But um, what I found there was a that, and this is not a university that's considered good by anyone, including people who go there. But it, this is one of the examples of like it getting down to the base masses, right? Like this is uh, as mainstream as it gets, let's say. So, um, and so what I found was a that a the quality of instruction wasn't very good, and we're talking grammatical errors in uh, lessons by the teacher, very basic grammatical errors. And um, then we're talking students who see the whole forum interaction thing as mainly a prerequisite they have to like tick off. 
Okay, like, so they give you prerequisites like, okay, you have to make two forum, read this um, thing on, say, Epic of Gilgamesh, the, the, read this PPT, which is full of graphical errors, makes no sense, uh, and uh, then make two forum posts about it, uh, and uh, respond to two other people's forum posts about it. And what we basically have is people making the most basic observations uh, of two, three lines. The Epic of Gilgamesh is very nice, I liked it, good story, good job. And then responding to it, I agree with this, what this person said. And this is the entire discussion. So where is the, there's no engagement here is what I'm saying. And while I'm not saying that this model cannot be used or that it's useless, but what do you feel that, you know, we need to somehow also make it, make students engage with it. And students are genetically predisposed to not engage with things. And how do we like, you know, how do we make sure that people aren't seeing this as, you know, I'll make two phone posts and then I'll go do something else. And I won't critically think about anything at all. Actually, do, you, do you mind if we just collect a few? Yeah, sure. And then we can, if there are any other comments. Um, my question, I believe, is posed to Lippi. So you spoke about bridging the gap between the urban and the rural, right, using technology. So I believe you've made it clear what exactly the predicament of the rural is. My question is on what is the predicament of the urban that can be filled in by the rural? Uh, it's, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Mashud, uh, 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 that uh, when you uh, you have the interviews and the, you know you have a lot of snippets from a lot of what other people have said people you've interviewed uh, I because you have you translated the interviews yourself into English because I think like if you had actually given us parts of it in either Hindi or Urdu or whichever language is spoken I think we would understand a lot better because I think a lot of things are perhaps getting lost in translation, the way they're relating to the issues in themselves. I just thought that. I have a question and it's addressed to both Soumya and Lippi. You've both talked about distance learning and e-learning and Soumya talked about pedagogical tools to make distance learning effective. But um, my question is when we talk about distance learning as a means of reaching the masses, uh, we see that Coursera, for example, has a 7 to 9% completion rate of the courses. Overall, the online course rate completion is about 10%. So is this distance learning for the masses, is it a kind of hierarchy here? Is it actually increasing the hierarchy rather than decreasing the hierarchy that the privileged students get to go to a university and get the benefit of excellent teachers? and the not so privileged kids have to do distance learning courses. That's my question. My question is to Malika. I mean, uh, you spoke about your experience at the internship program. So um, we spoke about how the students, you, you notice changes amongst the 32 students you train. So I want to know about um, what kind of changes did you, as a, as a person who was engaged into this uh, internship, faced in yourself? I mean, what kind of changes on an individual level the, does a person perceive um, on, on ground-based work? My question is to Soumya. You talked about how constructive, like blended learning helps in constructivist learning and how the pedagogy can be, pedagogy can be more efficient when translated through a computer. Now I have two questions to that, uh, comments to that. One, construct, how can you say that blended learning implies a more constructivist learning model if the construction of the environment is through the computer? Constructivist is a peer-to-peer -peer interaction of scaffolding which happens when two students are designing their learning environment by themselves. Now, if the computer is designing that learning environment, how can you have constructivist discourse? That's the first one. And 
The second one is you talk, uh, this is not only you, but generally in blended learning, you talk a lot about differentiated learning, how you can personalize learning based on the student and why that's more efficient. Now, what do you, like in this discourse, do you think that the, like, do you think that when the computer sort of differentiates learning, the teacher becomes rather than an instructor, a, facilita a facilitator, rather like a technician in this discourse. Because why, whereas the teacher must, would probably have a far more nuanced knowledge of this differentiated learning, when you have preset categories of how the computer differentiates learning, the student responds only to the computer itself. So how would you, like, would you sort of see a divorce in the way we think of differentiation of learning when we talk about blended learning versus how we talk about it in teaching learning practice, for example, because then blended learning is supposed to be like an interaction between face-to-face -face and face-to-face uh, -face learning and online learning. Okay, so coming to the point of uh, when we say that, uh, like you said, there are grammatical errors when there are online learning platforms, etc. I think uh, one drawback of accessibility or may basically providing the, the, the concern that we have areas or have certain constraints to, you know, accessibility, uh, can access knowledge and information through online learning. But I think, yes, uh, one major uh, role th uh, that this plays is the quality of what we are learning. And we, I think the, uh, the people who are constructing such courses and uh, people who are going ahead with online learning in itself uh, should definitely, uh, you know, consider the fact that quality is as important as as uh, providing accessibility is, which I think gradually, probably, because this is something new to, to everybody, probably gradually, uh, the quality increases as well. But yes, that is a point where, where we say that online learning needs to adhere to the quality as well, and ac providing accessibility is not the only uh, solution. Uh, other than that, about the distance learning, uh, when we say course dropouts and, uh, you know, if it creates a hierarchy, I think that's one way to look at it. But if you look at it by a perspective of somebody who, uh, ha for various constraints or various reasons, is not able to, uh, you know, study whatever, or study or learn or maybe hone their skills in a certain, in a certain way, but they're not able to. Uh, I mean, that's that's the perspective. Uh, we're, I mean, those are the people we're actually distance learning caters to. These e-learning courses, uh, it's basically a platform that they can access. Which, if if we completely discourage, if it wasn't existing, uh, wouldn't be. Uh, I mean, the per that person with the with the constraints that he has wouldn't be able to to learn whatever he's able to learn. So I think instead of uh, yes, the dropout rates are there because of the fact that it's not as interactive. The courses are not as interactive. They're not as, uh, I mean, it requires much more effort from a student's side than from the instructor's side. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's got its benefits as well. That, that's my point. Uh, moving on to uh, the fact that uh, the constructivist learning criteria and the discourse, it it, the, the instructor in itself, when it comes to online learning, does become a facilitator of a discussion. Uh, I mean, calling an instructor a technician would be a very uh, negative way to look at the, the fact that online learning and blended learning does actually provide a lot of, has its own benefits in, in its own way. And uh, in the end, when it comes to peer-to-peer -to -peer interactions or uh, feedbacks that come from the, straight from the instructor or discussions that are led straight from the instructor, instructor, forums that are created by the instructor. In many ways, the instructor is very well and is supposed to be very well, uh, you know, acquainted and uh, be very well in touch with the student even though the platform is an online medium. That's my point. Thank you. So you wanted to know like uh, what change as an individual came into me after my internship? Yes. Yeah. So uh, as I said before that uh, I got 32 students, right? So they were in this uh, TSWRS school. The school is English medium school. But the students uh, doesn't even recognize the English alphabets. 
when you write them on the board any spelling some of uh, some of them can't even um, you know recognize a for apple although it's an english medium school so uh, during my internship when the students came to me when they talked about their life experiences what they want to become they want to become doctor they want to become a lecturer they want to become engineers then the thing that struck in my mind was god i am leading such a easy life you know went to an english medium school learned there mom dad sent me to hyderabad studied there is like i don't know what life is actually what are the you know um hardships that i need to actually face after coming back from those after coming back from that internship place <coughs> i actually saw that change in me as like life is not that easy you need to work hard to achieve your goals where people are like they want to become something but they cannot so i hope i get this thank you Uh, yeah regarding your question on the translation i i was extremely inclined to use uh, both the dialects as in uh, the i the conversation happened in hindustani uh, primarily in urdu uh, but uh, because of i mean i was inclined to use the actual narratives and then translate in english because uh, uh, by while problematizing mainstream and standardization i must say I'm, i i fell into the pitfall of standardizing everything and saying ki sabko english aayegi uh, and also yaar matlab hamari matlab jitni durust aapki urdu hai utni yahan pe sabki nahi hai unfortunately and uh, but I, i i would be very happy to share the narratives in their original uh, uh, text because i i do agree that a lot more than the meaning i think a lot of uh, values which were attached uh, to to their education which the students were talking about might have been missed in these narratives but i will be very happy to share them after this session how is it uh so this is for you uh, the uh, about distance learning yeah so uh, as you were saying that it it's uh, more of a high art than uh, like uh, a help for them uh, i think that's not really true because the whole idea that there's uh, that they are getting to learn uh, i mean at first place uh, th- uh, there could have been a thing that they might not have got to uh, this place where they are learning at least they are uh, getting an education which is imp- I-, i think that's the important point uh, it's more about getting education than uh, than the social status i don't know i th- that's a co- what i think is there anything you want to say yeah it's just that um it's just that uh i've often heard this kind of argument that uh people from a background from a lower background from a poorer area at least they're getting some form of education it's better than no form of education and uh it sort of sickens me in a way because i feel that everybody should have the access to an excellent education and that's why you talked about how you talked about this uh krishi program and so distance learning has arise it is in the context of providing professional skills computer skills it skills farming skills all that sort of stuff and uh, it might have its uses there but when you start saying that you should supplement that this should be the that this is the only form of education that people get what i mean to say is that i worry that with the explosion of the internet and our and moocs being the hot word of 2012 and distance learning taking on a whole new this thing i worry that this will prevent us from expanding our education budget for putting out the real hard work that it takes into educate hundreds and thousands and lakhs of teachers and start hundreds and thousands of schools and colleges and basically provide an excellent education for people of all backgrounds and then once they have the opportunity to access an excellent education then let them decide if they want to study vocational or professional studies of some kind Right. Uh, one more. Okay. You don't have. You don't have to respond to yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. These are very difficult questions. That and then. I have a question to Mashud. 
Uh, I'm curious about the use of tool, like what kind of interview, like what kind of interview did you do? Did you do like an unstructured interview or a structured interview? Because I noticed like in your exploring modernity that we usually think when people go from like a quote unquote traditional education to a quote unquote mainstream education, they say that mainstream education alienated them from traditional education. Or main, like with the mainstream consciousness, they are they sort of deny their traditional education. But here, like the like what I saw in your like you know small snippets, the opposite happened. Or I didn't really see higher education being alienating for them. So I wonder why our present discourse is about like people coming from quote unquote backward regions are being alienated by the higher education course system, but people from these madrasas in fact are engaging more with their traditional education. So if you maybe did an unstructured interview, it would explain maybe why the answers were more designed towards your you know, sort of study. And so like, you know, maybe you could explain their use of tools and what, like if maybe, you know, because you had such a VK so maybe they did talk about, but, about that, but you couldn't bring it in your presentation. My question is for uh, Samya, right? Uh, so one thing I'm really sick of is is um, these continuous mention of theories and the way things should be. No one talks about the process that has to go from how things are and the way things should be. And all it ends up being is hours and hours of intellectual masturbation leading to nowhere. So we are talking about how uh, distance learning or e-learning is right now. We know how it should be. We do not know the process that will uh, transpire within that. How, how do you think we should navigate those spaces to attain that kind of an understanding? Actually, can I just add something to it? Um, you know, you take the current, lot of protests happened recently, uh, not the most recent ones, but the ones, but the ones just before it uh, around Occupy, Occupy UGC, right? And uh, they, those were about, they, they were precipitated or triggered by that uh, fellowship issue, right? The non-net fellowship. Uh, now the fellowship itself is uh, a secondary. The larger question is, on the one hand, uh, you have, if you just gather all the programs of the state right now and just put them together, they actually contradict each other. Uh, so on the one hand, you have smart in city and digital India, which are going to produce e-waste of all kinds. Uh, then there is Swachh Bharat, you know. So what? So uh, and then on the then you have this Skill India, which someone mentioned earlier. Uh, but then you're cutting fellowships. So who's going to teach uh, and 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 uh, and become teachers as a result of that? So they, if you just put these things together, they don't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, uh, together and uh, and I wonder. I'm just sort of this this whole thing is uh, triggered back to Mayor's uh, uh, comment earlier uh, in terms of long-term vision for 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 higher education, right? And whether uh, this this is additional or supplementary, complementary, or with, whether it's going to be replacing uh, uh, university systems and so on. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the uh, the question. Uh, and I also think that the the question of research methodology uh, is something which uh, I would want to more focus more on. But uh, for this particular study, uh, what I did was I started uh, by going to the Madarsa, uh, which is uh, in Delhi, to to gauge exactly where where the students are coming from, and uh, from there I was able to get uh, contacts uh, of Madarsa graduates who are in JNU, and uh, all of them are pursuing. Uh, their uh, education, higher education in Arabic. So, um, uh, uh, with a kind of a snowball, uh, a snowballing method, I was able to uh, get around seven or eight students uh, pursuing Arabic, and I uh, conducted a group discussion, uh, semi-structured, but it was focused on the theme of higher education choices and uh, on students reflecting back at their mother's education. Uh, from the vantage point of being in the university, uh, of having made that transition. Uh, so this is the, broadly the 
methodology which I did adopt, and uh, maybe you can uh, uh, maybe critique or add something uh, how the methodology can be made more rigorous. Uh, uh, the talk, what we talked about alienation. Uh, you said uh, your reference point was basically, I think, other studies or other narratives which you might have heard, which where traditional, where, where this transition from traditional to mainstream causes alienation. However, what I have understood from what the learners understand from their own experiences is that this, this uh, dichotomy which I was talking about of this movement from traditional to modern or traditional to mainstream is something which really doesn't exist in the way me or you might think. Uh, for them, it's really a natural course of, uh, you know, a natural choice of education, natural course of education. So because when students graduate there, I, uh, the whole idea of uh, the pull factor from, from the alumni, from when they see their seniors going to the university um, and pursuing uh, Arabic, and when they go and join them. So th there's this, um, some kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's not like a, a shock for them. Of course, I mean, uh, on a lighter note, so some of the students I was talking to, they said ki, when we go to the university, we are like, 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 so it's, it's more to do with, you know, adapting with the culture of the university and all that. But this, uh, you know, this consciousness of me being from the margins or the alternate, and coming to a mainstream, you know, is something which they understand differently. And I, I don't think, I mean, uh, at least what I gauge from the narratives is that that alienation doesn't happen. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique uh, route for them. Uh, for them, it's, it's a very mainstream thing of, you know, Arabic, uh, I mean, graduating from a madrasa and then doing something like Arabic and then, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, going to for a job or something else. So, uh, do you have any other question uh, to follow it up? Uh, I'd like to follow you up again, like after probably this panel is over, because I have several questions. But one comment I can make is perhaps the alienation is not so pronounced because you chose people who are studying Arabic, and therefore the language would be uh, like I, I'm sorry, I forgot to add one more thing. Uh, yeah. the, these narratives have, have been collected. Uh, through individual interviews. So all the themes which emerged from that group discussion, uh, I use them to kind of uh, create, uh, to, to create again, uh, more structured, but still they were like, s still semi-structured interviews, but they were individual interviews, which okay. through which narratives are correct. Yeah, I'm sorry for yeah. interrupting. Yeah, I was saying that perhaps one of the reasons, like one of the many, like I also cannot comment on this having not known your study, but it's because that they are engaging with Arabic and their texts are in Arabic. So perhaps going from madrasa to a higher education space where the culture and the texts they're engaging with is mostly in Arabic would mean that like the alienation is not perhaps with the text, but perhaps with other sorts of cultural engagement like methods of dress or food. Because for, uh, for many students who are coming from the margins, the biggest alien shock is prob probably the fact that other people in the class are English graduates or from first language medium being English, coming from a very westernized model. But in these, you, like maybe you could check out the class compositions of the graduates of the people in this class, like whether most of them are from, like what kind of background most of them are coming from studying Arabic. I don't know, it's just a comment that per me, you can pick up and I'm sure we can continue this discussion after the panel. Okay, uh, so uh, regarding uh, the alienation of, you know, I mean, again, I'm understanding alienation as a shock of being in a very different foreign culture, I mean, uh, I mean by looking around you. So, uh, of, of course, like, I mean, they uh, like this this whole idea of you know uh, dress and uh, you know what uh, what you're wearing or how you're you know looking around uh, i i won't st i don't still uh, think that there is uh, there's also this change in you know how you engage with knowledge you know mm -hmm. because i mean and that's i think that shock is for everyone you know not this i mean if someone is from like a mainstream school uh, there is 
when you go when you are in a school there are a lot of restrictions you, there are there is a limit up to which you can question there is a, there is a limit to how much you can think you know and same is with someone uh, from a madrasa but of course it, it is as much a shock for me you know when i come to the university uh, in terms of you know how how much i can think you know where where is that limit on you know uh, uh, there there's restriction on internet in the madrasa but when i come here and i access uh, so much of knowledge be it in my own arabic which has been inaccessible to me in the madrasa and in the university it's out there i can use google scholar for it so i mean i don't know if it's a shock or it's it's a new thing i mean it's a new thing it, i mean i won't see alienation here in a very negative sense but it, it it's 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 something new and we can have a conversation on this outside there anyways thank you um i've had experience with online learning like coursera like this gentleman mentioned the biggest restriction i faced personally was though the course material is free and the videos are great in order to get a certificate i have to pay for it though the coursera is considered pre online courses so how how does that help a person who's 100 kilometers outside of delhi in a village somewhere pay to get a certificate if it's one beyond their means and two it's in a different currency for example if you take a com complete package at coursera it's 250 dollars how can you expect a person who's out in the village to pay that money just to get a certificate and if they don't get the certificate their education is not recognized by any company or anybody so they're stuck so what's mm -hmm. the point of having it mm -hmm. what's the point of having online education is if you can't use it later because you can't pay 250 dollars so that should also be taken into consideration as well not just accessibility but affordability as well yeah i think maybe one last comment just um, one uh, just one follow up comment very small i think what uh, she has raised the point is very important and i think the answer lies in the fact basically authentication it's not about expansion but authentication when someone pays 250 dollars and gets a certificate it becomes c that means this degree means something and if you look at this government's policy i think it is extremely ominous what they are trying to do is that they are trying to move many things to digital domain so that people can get i hate to use this term superficial education on many levels i'm not saying on all levels and government can show look literacy rate spiked up look this many people are getting degrees from these colleges although many of them are actually online degrees without proper custodianship without proper verification so i think basically sometimes private companies like coursera are basically looking for the authentication of their material through payment and through financial terms um yeah so my question was uh, is to molika so um i need to know that um, you know that teachers um, need to cater to the needs of each and every student because there's a different bent um in each in every individual towards learning so um how did you ensure that like although they didn't know the basic uh, basic english but still you know the skill of uh, developing the problem solving attitude and everything how did you ensure that yeah okay i guess we'll have you have the last word on this then yeah. uh thank you for the question yeah the when i went there it's like um, i was said the basic means of communication should be english actually i asked them this question too like the children st uh, sitting there doesn't know the basic alphabets so how will i communicate to them so we are allotted a co counselor to us so we are the counselor the students sitting there are campers and we are allotted a co counselor from their school or some other school who have done this internship or went to went to that internship as a camper before so she will if the campers doesn't understand what we are speaking and we are saying to them she will convey them the same thing in the simplest way she can so yeah in a way it was difficult and then um, as the students were telugu so yeah i ended up learning some words so that i can you know easily communicate to them so yeah all right thanks so much uh, for all the comments and questions really a lot of stuff um, still unanswered but then there are, these aren't easy easy to uh, figure out uh, everyone is still figuring these things out um so this is i think it for uh, for day 1 uh, of the of the conference 
there is a session planned here, but that is only a few of us. Uh, you can explore the city, whoever is from outside. Uh, this is a very, very nice neighborhood. Uh, if this is the first time you are here, uh, plenty to do and see. So, good luck for all of that. Bye.